next. So usually we define logarithms or really any inverse function in terms of its non-inverse counterpart. But I'm going to show today that at least in one of these cases, we can define it in terms of an antiderivative. So the particular function we'll look at today is the natural logarithm. So let's recall that usually we say that y is equal to the natural log of x if and only if x is equal to e to the y. So in other words, we're defining the natural logarithm in terms of this exponential function. But the question is, could we instead define natural log of x to be the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt and achieve the same result? And by the same result, I mean, is this natural log defined in terms of this antiderivative actually the inverse of our exponential function? Well, that's what we'll see. So let's introduce a little bit of notation. So let's maybe set f of x equal to this antiderivative. So we'll have 1 to x of 1 over t dt. And then let's go ahead and set g of x equal to the exponential function. And really to hone in on what we're trying to do here, we're trying to show that f composed with g is the identity function. So in other words, f composed with g of x is equal to x. And we're also trying to show that g composed with f of x is x. So we really do have invertibility here of functions. I guess I should point out that the domain of G is all real numbers, whereas the range is just positive real numbers, and we have the opposite situation over here. The domain here is positive real numbers, and the range is all real numbers. Okay, so let's maybe get to this. We'll start with F composed with G. So let's maybe introduce a variable y because we're going to take some derivatives and this will just make everything look a little bit nicer. So let's say y is, like I said, f composed with g. So that'll end up being the integral from 1 up to g of x, which is in this case e to the x of 1 over t dt. So we're left with something like that. And now let's take the derivative and we're going to use some tools that you probably learned in calculus class. We'll in fact use the rule that the derivative of e to the x is itself and we'll also use the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. So this derivative of y is equal to, well so it'll be 1 over t evaluated at e to the x, so that's 1 over e to the x. And then we have to multiply by the derivative of e to the x because we have a composition. So that means we have 1 over e to the x times e to the x. Well, this is clearly equal to just the number 1. But if y prime is equal to 1, that means that y is equal to x plus a constant, just from taking the antiderivative of both sides. But also, let's notice that y evaluated at 0 is equal to 0. Well, let's check that. So we have y evaluated at 0 is the integral from 1 up to e to the 0, which is 1 of 1 over t dt. So that's equal to 0. So putting this together with our general form, you see that in fact, y is equal to the function x. But if we cut out the middle thing here, we see that f composed with g of x is x, which means that we do have this over here. We have checked this first condition. So now let's look at the second condition. So now looking at the second condition, we will compose g with f. And maybe like I'll call this y as well. I'll reuse my dependent variable y. So y is equal to, like I said, g composed with f of x. So what will that be? That will be e to the power, the antiderivative of 1 to the x of 1 over t dt. Okay, great. Now let's take the derivative and see what we get. So here, taking the derivative, we will have e to the antiderivative of 1 to x of 1 over t dt 
times the derivative of this inside function. I'll write that out in this case. So the derivative with respect to x of the antiderivative or the integral from one to x of one over t dt. Okay, nice. But now, using the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, it's quite easy to take this antiderivative and we see that we'll get one over x for this antiderivative. But now using the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's quite easy to take this derivative and we'll see that we get one over x. So that means we have y prime equals one over x times Oh, look at this, we have another copy of g composed with f. So I'll call that y again. So check it out, we have y prime equals one over x times y. Now the path you might think of to go from here would be to divide by y and then solve this differential equations using separation of variables. But if you do that, you might notice that at some point you will use the fact that the exponential function and the logarithmic function are inverses. But that's exactly what we're trying to get at. So that means we need another approach given that we're trying to stay away from that fact. So here's what I'll do. Let's take this and take the derivative one more time. So that'll be minus one over x squared times y. That's what we get from taking the derivative of one over x and then plus one over x times y prime. But now let's recall that one over x times y was equal to y prime. So that means we can make that little substitution there and we'll see that we get y double prime is equal to minus one over x squared times y plus one over x squared times y. In other words, it's equal to zero. So we have the second derivative equals zero. But if the second derivative equals zero, we know that our original function is a quadratic polynomial at the most. Okay, so we've got y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. And now we'll determine a, b, and c by evaluating this at some numbers. Okay, so let's notice that c is equal to y evaluated at zero, but y evaluated at zero is e to the integral from one to zero of one over t dt. Okay, but that integral in fact diverges and it diverges to minus infinity. So this is equal to e to the minus infinity. And I guess I'm abusing notation here. Really we need a limit there and we would see that the limit of the exponent is approaching minus infinity. So you can work that out more caref carefully if you like to, but we're gonna leave it like that. Here we'll take this to be equal to zero, which is what would occur for the limit. Okay, so looking at this, we have c is equal to zero. And now from here, we'll set x equal to one to see what we get. So setting x equal to one in the polynomial part will give us a plus b. Recall that we just determined that c was equal to zero. So that's equal to y, to y evaluated at one, which is e to the integral from one to one of one over t dt. But that integral is equal to zero as we're integrating over a single point. So we have e to the zero, which is one. So we have a plus b is equal to one. So let's underline that as well. And now we have to determine maybe another equation that involves a and b. So where could we go for that? Well, perhaps we could use the first derivative. So let's plug this polynomial version of y into our first derivative formula. That's gonna give us something like this. 2ax plus b is equal to one over x times y. But now evaluating that at one will give us something like nice, which we can use to finally determine a and b. So setting x equal to one here, will give us 2a plus b equals one over one times y of one. But we just determined that y of one was equal to one, so we have this is equal to one. 
Okay, so let's see. Now we have 2a plus b is equal to one and a plus b is also equal to one. So now maybe subtracting those two equations, we'll see that a is equal to zero. And then after seeing that a is equal to zero, we get that b is equal to one. So now we can take this and plug in those two values of a and b and we'll see that y is equal to x in this case as well. But that clears up this composition. So either way we compose these two functions, we get the identity function, which means they really are inverses of each other. And that clears up this question. Could we just define this natural log in terms of the integral and achieve the inverse function? And in fact, we could. So we're clearly not doing anything super surprising here because if this didn't work, then this logarithm would not be well defined. That being said, I think it's like a pretty fun game just to check that all of these things work in this backward direction. And it does highlight some interesting techniques. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.